Uh, welcome. This is uh, Fundamentals of Micro Nano Fabrication. I'm Sushobhan Avasti from IIC Bangalore. Uh, and in this lecture, we shall continue the general module on process integration. We were looking at how silicon solar cells get made at very large throughput and at very low cost. Uh, in the last lecture, we had uh, started with the wafer. We had gone all the way. We have done diffusion, cleaning. Uh, we had finished uh, deposition of the silicon nitride using PECVD. Uh, in this lecture, we shall now continue, uh, see how electrodes get deposited, how the modules get made and how the whole thing is put together into something you can sell to a consumer. So, let us get started. So, in the previous lecture we had as I said we had finished PCVD. So, this is what the cross section looks like. So, you had silicon wafer, uh, you have this orange layer which is the doped uh, uh, phosphorus. You ha the doping is on the both sides because you were doing this without any patterning. So, there is a phosphorus on the back side too. And this phosphorus as we shall later see will go away, but for now it is there. And on top of the front surface, we have deposited another layer of PECVD silicon nitride, which is this dark blue color, and that is to prevent reflection of or reduce reflection of light. Okay. So, now we have to deposit metal. Uh, till now, if you notice, we have been very strategic. We have completely gotten rid of all patterning processes. We have not done one lithography step, and as you shall see in the rest of the lecture, we shall not do any lithography. Lithography is just way too expensive, and for 100 micron type features, Lithography is an overkill. It's like trying to, I don't know, use a Ferrari to uh, where a tractor can work. Uh, it's just not worth it to uh, do a very expensive uh, lithography systems and do 100 micron features. It just doesn't make any sense. So the industry sort of moved away from lithography to more scalable, cheaper, and other methods of doing patterning, specifically screen printing. Now screen printing cannot do. Uh, say anything thinner than 10 micron, maybe cannot do anything thinner than 20 micron. But that is all, but that is enough for solar cells where the features are 100 microns or these days around 30, 40 micron. Uh, that is plenty, that is plenty. So, that is what we try to do and I will explain how a screen printer works and uh, how do we get a pattern and from then we will understand how do we deposit a patterned metal. Okay? So, this is what a screen printer look like. So, what you have is you have a frame. And on this frame, uh, you attach a screen. So, the screen actually has the pattern. So, this is what the screen looks like. Okay. Uh, this screen has holes in strategic places and is, uh, does not have holes in other places. So, wherever it has holes, an ink can go through. Wherever there is no hole, the ink will not go through. Uh, how exactly is the screen made uh, is given here. We shall come to it, but for now, just bear with me. So, screen has holes. Wherever there is hole, ink will go through. So, then what you do is you attach that screen you add some metal paste and these metal paste are metallic paste. So, silver, aluminum, so we have paste for these things. Uh, th uh, they are not, uh, they are not uh, fully formed metal, right? So, they are sticky, viscous pastes, they are semi-liquid. What hope is that they, they, they have a whole bunch of uh, organic materials that allow them to flow. The hope is that you would dry it and after that you would cure it at a very high temperature and during that curing process all the organics will uh, uh, desorb out and leave behind the silver or aluminum and that would make the metal contact. So, that is how this process is done. So, you have metal paste, this is a specialty product uh, sold by specialty people uh, and so th this is an important part of your technology that which metal paste are you using. Okay. So, anyways you do that metal paste here, so that is what you see this grey coloured liquid that you see on the top and then there is a squeegee which is nothing like but like a blade of some sort and that squeegee is pushed uh, against this screen and dragged from left to right and that as it is dragged from left to right the edge pushes the paste through these holes in the screen and out and these hole and then it gets printed on the substrate. So, whatever is a pattern on the screen gets transferred to the substrate. So, that is how screen printing works. If you zoom into the screen, screen itself is uh, nothing but a mesh. So, it is just a steel mesh and through these holes in the mesh, your, your uh, ink will go through. Now, whenever you want to make a pattern, what you do is you add some of these, um, so these ceramic plates of some sort which uh, clog up the holes. So, these holes are filled up, right? So, because these holes are filled up, uh, the uh, metal ink will not go through. But metal will, will go through in uh, through the mesh which is exposed. How small can you print? Uh, you can imagine like the smallest you can print is some function of what is the smallest hole you can have in this mesh, right? 
Uh, if you try to print something smaller than this mesh uh, mesh opening, then of course it would not work, right? It would not look like a continuous line. It would look jagged and it would break. So the technology of printing or the size, the critical dimension of printing is decided by the mesh. Now what is stopping you from making a finer mesh? A finer mesh provides more uh, resistance for the flow of the ink. So then your ink must be more uh, fluid. But the ink is fluid, then what will happen? It will go through the hole, get printed and then spread out. Right? It will not hold shape. So there is this fine balance where you want the ink to be viscous enough to hold shape, but at the same time not so viscous that it is unable to go through the holes. And uh, while we keep pushing the technology as the, at the current state of the art is that you uh, cannot pl uh, print reliably below 30-20 micron. Most commercial in the Indian manufacturers that I know of uh, tend to print somewhere between 30 to 60 microns. Okay. So that's the thinnest they can make. So that is what these lie. So these are these fingers, these are fingers as they are called. This is the thinnest line you can make. This is the critical dimension of your printing. There are thicker dimensions that you print, which are called bus bars. So for example, in the, uh, if you zoom in, this is the bus bar area. This is the thicker bus bar and this is the thin finger. And this, this thin finger gets translated to the finger here. And this thick bus bar gets translated to this bus bar here. So that's how pattern transfer happens without using photolithography through a, through a squeegee and a screen printing machine. Okay. Let's get back to the solar production. So in solar production, what we are going to first do is we are going to coat the backside and make the back electrode. So what we do is we coat aluminum paste. So this is what aluminum. So aluminum is on the backside. And we leave some holes where we deposit silver. Okay. Uh, this silver is where we would actually do make the solderable contact. The aluminum is our p-type dopant. Ultimately, this aluminum will form this p plus layer. This doesn't happen during the printing because in the printing process, it's just a liquid. This happens during the firing process where this whole paste becomes dry and you form aluminum and then aluminum diffuses. So P plus step will happen later. All we have right now done is coated this aluminum paste on the silicon wafer. You can actually see that this aluminum paste is wet. And uh, so all you have is this printed aluminum. You still have not formed your back surface field yet. That will happen down the line. After you're done with this, uh, then you deposit your AG. So this AG is the same thing as this. Uh, you also have to do the front side AG. I think I have another slide to show that. Yeah. So then you do the front side AG. So that is this structure here. Okay. Uh, this AG paste and this AG paste are a little different. Why? Because this AG paste must penetrate the silicon nitride to make contact with silicon. Uh, if you remember the lectures on diffusion, silicon nitride is a pretty good diffusion barrier. It's a masking layer. So you have to do something special to uh, force the metal through the silicon nitride. And what they do is they add some grit. And through that grit, the AG paste is able to break through the silicon nitride and make contact with silicon. And by using this grit and breaking through, you once again avoid a photolithography step. You don't need to do any patterning. Uh, you just pattern the metal using screen printing and do the firing. And during the firing, the AG will go through the silicon nitride make contact with silicon. You don't have to do any patterning on the silicon nitride separately. right? So you save a step. So uh, there's another example of what a screen printing system looks like. This is an inline screen printer. So you can see that the wafers are coming from that direction and the wafers are going out in that direction. And within seconds, you're printing these patterns. You can actually see the front electrode patterns on here. Uh, you see no pattern here because it's yet to be printed. And this continuously keeps happening. Okay. So at the end of the day, you get some structure legs like this. Now remember, these are printed. They are still semi-solid viscous liquids. Uh, they have not dried yet. So they first they are dried. And after dried, they have to be fired to actually form the metal. Okay. So this is what you do through the firing. So you take these wafers and again, you send them through a furnace. But this is called a belt furnace. Continuous inline process. Low cost, continuous inline process. They don't like batch processes. So the wafers go in from the back. The wafers come out from the front. And um, the whole inside the whole long furnace, there is a whole range of temperatures. And this profile of this temperature is very precisely maintained. And uh, during this profile, both all the metal layers that we have deposited, the back AG, the front AG, the aluminum back surface field, all of these are cured at the same time. right? So it's not like we do one layer, then furnace, one layer furnace, one layer furnace. That would take too long. <laughs> so they have optimized this all 
into one firing step will cure all the three pastes. Okay? So, you do that and uh, when you do that the aluminum back surface field in formed in the back and that is how you get rid of the orange or the phosphorus doped layer in the back side. You just override the phosphorus doped layer with the aluminum doped layer which is a P plus. So, you have the P plus, you have the P layer, you have the N plus, you have the silicon nitride on the top, you have the aluminum on the bottom, you have silver contacts, silver contacts. Done. So, that is how a commercial silicon solar cell is made. Okay? Uh, the uh, other things to note is, is that uh, just wanted to highlight that how important small uh, optimizations are. So, here for example, there are four different recipes that were tried in this furnace where the temperatures in each of these six zones were slightly different. And with very small changes in temperature, you can actually get small changes in efficiency. But for a researcher, difference between 6.25 and 6.4 is minuscule, maybe not worth thinking about. But for a commercial fabrication system that is producing thousands of wafer an hour, any small increase in power is a lot of money on the table. So, I think there's some are, are like each small efficiency improvement is worth a few million dollars or some number like that. Okay. Overall, this is what a structure finally looks like. If you take an SEM image, uh, this is what the P type silicon is. You have the front AG electrode, you have the batch aluminum paste, this is where the aluminum back surface field has happened uh, and this is your P, P plus junction. Okay? Hey, what a commercial silicon cell looks like from the front and back, this blue tinge is because of the silicon nitride that we have deposited. You see the front electrode, you see the back aluminum surface field, the back AG electrode and uh, all of these different cells then have to be connected in series to actually make a module. And in order to do that, these bus bars, these bus bars are sold, soldered. So, one bus bar is soldered to the next and that is typically done with these called tabs. So, you see this tab, this metal wire that is connected to the wafer. So, this connection is done on the bus bar. And uh, yeah, so these tabs are then done and each tab is connected to another and you make a module. Now, before you go there, however, you have to do testing and sorting. So, your thousands of wafers and hours are coming out. Not all of them have exactly the same efficiency. And uh, typically in a module, all the cells are in series. What that means is they must have the same current. But if there are slight variations, they will not have the same current. And if you connect them in series without doing any sort of sorting, then you lose out a lot of the efficiency. So, what people do is they sort of sort it in bins, the highest efficiency, next highest, next highest. The number of bins can be 16, 20. And uh, in each bin, then you, before making a module, you would only take wafers from one bin. You would not mix and match. Okay. So, yeah, they, the, the sorting can be done manually. In this case, this lady is doing the sorting that can also be done automatically. Now, there are these automatic systems which should measure the efficiency, calculate which bin it should be in and appropriately store it in different holders. And uh, yeah, so you have to do testing and sorting before. Typical modules um, they have are either 60 cell modules or 72 cell modules. Though these days, people have started making much larger modules. But the vanilla modules are 72 cells. So, you need 72 of these 6 inch cells to make one module. Okay? Now, what is a module? So, module is just a structure that provides some physical support to these cells while they last, while, so they can work out in the field without getting damaged. And other day we are looking at what 180 micron thick silicon, it can easily get damaged. So, um, if you look at the cross section, you would have these PN junctions and they are all connected in series. So, there must be a contact made from the top of the n-type to the bottom of the p-type, right? So, these are the tabs that we discussed, okay? And uh, you will connect 72 of these cells one after the other. That is just the electrical part. Uh, in order to protect them from the environment, uh, you have the top tempered glass. Often, this glass has some anti-reflection coatings on it also. Uh, you would have either a glass on the back side, the glass on the back side is there if the module is designed to accept light from both sides, those are called bifacial modules. But that's not very common, the more common thing is the back side is just mechanical support, so it has some uh, often a Tedlar film, Tedlar is some pony vinyl fluoride. And uh, between this glass and the back surface, uh, you have to, there is a lot of space, right? It's a lot of empty space. You don't want to leave that empty space where the wafers can move around. So, what you do is you fill it with something called a potent. So, this is what the potent. The potent is EVA. Um, EVA is, is a plastic, it's a petroleum uh, based product. Uh, a lot of the soles of your shoes, if they are um, rubber or plastic, they are probably EVA. 
okay so yeah if you have cheap chappals or cheap shoes it's probably eva so that was that kind of material but of course we were use the one that does not have any color it's transparent it's stable so you just fill the whole place with eva so all this yellow is eva okay and it uh, just fills all the nooks and crannies and make sure that the wafers don't have any place to move so this is the cross section this is the front section so you see the aluminum frame you see the front front uh, glass you see the wafers you see the encapsulant this encapsulant is the eva film uh then the back sheet um you see the bus bars the individual wafers connected and finally the electrical connections have to come out right so what you do is you attach a junction box and the junction box is then connected to the wires right so that's what a wafer looks like sorry the module looks like and ha huh, this aluminum uh, frame provides some rigidity so right so it can withstand some some sort of abuse while it's being installed okay so that's what a module would look like um if you look at a zoomed out image this is what module would look like so you have the 72 cells so 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 cross 12 72 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 cross 12 72 uh, each of these modules is around um, 1 by 1.5 meters in size and um, the multi crystalline wafers because they have square shaped uh, when you make a module uh, they don't really have any dead space in the middle so you see it looks a completely filled there's no white area but the mono crystalline cell has this rounded pseudo uh, square corners right so when you make a module you can actually see these squarish or uh, smooth square shapes that are left open now this of course is a loss right because it's not absorbing sunlight but there's nothing we can do about it that's just the shape of the cell so as the technologies have progressed um, silicon uh, solar manufacturers have tried to reduce the size of this dead space but still uh, in modern mono crystalline modules uh, this dead space still exists so you can actually tell just by looking at a wave panel whether it's mono crystalline or multi crystalline just by this presence or absence of these holes uh, the mono crystalline cells also look much more darker little more blacker they are because uh, they have better texturing um because as we discussed we's very easy to form pyramids on those right multi crystal wafers don't have that good uh, texturing so they reflect a little so they have this bluish tinge more of uh once again uh, you see the grain size in the multi crystal cells you don't see any grain size in the mono crystal cells Dif- depending on different technologies the number of cells uh, how ca- how much care you're using what your process is you can get typically um Uh, 72 cell modules typically give out output somewhere between 300 to 400 watts mostly towards 300 320 watts maybe 340 watts rarely on the upper side of 400 that is if you have hetero junction or some other advanced technology all right so with that we come to an end of this lecture um, i just hope you get a sense of uh, how even though we they are also still doing microfabrication but solar cell does a very slightly different form of microfabrication and how they have were able to reduce cost uh, not use photolithography do patterning in more traditional ways and still get a uh, very efficient and marketable electronic product so yeah something to think about uh, thank you for your time and i guess this is the my last lecture in this lecture uh, in this course so Thank you for those of you who have lasted this long thank you and I'll see you sometime later bye